Right, this morning we are continuing our sermon series on how do I go deeper. Well, exactly, our sermon series is Behold, but tonight today's title is How Do I Go Deeper. So if you've got a Bible, open it up at 1 Corinthians, and we're going to read chapter 14, verses 26 to 33. So you can uh, open your Bible or turn it on, unlock it, whatever. Um, there we go. <laughs> Juggling. I can also juggle. Oh, I was, right, I'm just going to read it from my iPad because never mind. Right. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 33. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of, of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not the God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Amen. I'm going to stop there. So, who gets the Friday email? Show of hands, who's, who's on the Friday email? Has anyone not been getting a Friday email? Just show your hands. Right, so your Friday email's in your junk mail. I'm sorry about that. It's MailChimp. They changed the settings a few months ago. Check your junk mail. Add me to the approved senders list on your email. If you don't know how to do that, Google it. Um, I, you, you are getting it. I've not taken you off any list. I keep having people say, have you taken me off the list? No. You can take yourself off the list, but I will never do that unless you ask us to. Um, so anyway, on my Friday email this week, you'll have seen a boiler, a flat tire, and uh, a hoover. That was, that was kind of my title. In my subject lines, I'm just going to let you into a little secret. I just try to write something in the subject line that makes you go, oh, what's that? So that you click on it. It's purely manipulation. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not apologizing for it because there's stuff in there that we want you to read. So I want to try and make it so that you want to read it. And so that's why sometimes I'll use a bit of humor in the email. Obviously, there's a lot of information in there. But just a little insight into me. And also, I try and keep it short and punchy. And you kind of go, oh, what's that? And you click on it. Sometimes I have no inspiration. I just write the Friday email. <laughs> Because <laughs> I just like, I don't know what to write. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this week, a hoover, a boiler, and a flat tire. So um, a couple of Sundays ago, when we were last here, um, we had quite a stripped back service kind of set up, uh, tech set up, which is because the van had a flat battery, which I will put my hand up and say was totally my fault. There's a light that goes on in the back of the van, which has a separate switch. I put it on so I could see what I was doing when I was tidying up the van. I forgot to switch it off, so I apologize. So all of that weeks kind of stripped back setup was totally my fault. Anyway, so we, we managed, we got together, um, John was on team and pulled together some PA and we made it work and it was, it was good. Uh, I got home and, um, and my, uh, Lindsay opened the cupboard after dinner to get something out of like the boiler cupboard, I don't know, cleaning or whatever she was doing. Um, she was like, oh, why is it wet? Why is, why, is the, why is it wet? And I'm like, I don't know. It shouldn't be wet in there. There's no reason for it to be wet. And the boiler was leaking water out of this one like bolt, which I couldn't get my spanner to without like pulling loads of stuff off boilers. I don't know what I'm doing in a boiler, so I didn't try it. If it was a plug that had broken, I can do electrics, I can do stuff. I'm, I'm pretty handy when it comes to boilers, not a chance. Um, I tried to tighten up a screw, that didn't work. So I was like, seriously, my boiler? Anyway, the next morning we woke up and like the pressure had dropped because obviously all the water would come out of it. We had no hot water. So I phoned British Gas because I had that home serve thing, which is helpful, I suppose. Um, and um, oh, it is if, if this didn't happen afterwards. Um, it's because it gets worse, like every good story. Um, so the guy comes out like on the, I think it was the Tuesday. I waited in all day Monday because I said they were coming Monday. And at half five, I'm like, they're supposed to be in, uh, they said to be in between eight and six. So uh, somebody was in between eight and six, and it was mostly me all day, working at home, sitting there, got my kids picked up for me so I didn't have to leave the house just in case. It gets to half five, and there's someone's not come yet. So I'm like, what? What's going on? So I went on the uh, on the interwebs and I had a look on the thing where it says about your appointment and where they're up to. And it says, you don't have an appointment today. Now, I've been checking it all day. I did have an appointment. 
Um, I had a text to say I had an appointment, to say someone would be coming. I don't have an appointment. So I am by this point fuming because I've been in all day. <laughs> I've been sat there waiting for someone to come and fix my boiler. So I'm then straight on to like phoning them up. Our offices are closed. They're only open between nine and five. And I'm like <laughs> so you can feel like the blood's starting to boil a little bit more. So then I'm like on their chat thing. There's no people available you know, on their website chat thing. So then I'm like, right, I'm going Twitter angry right now. So I went on Twitter, at British Gas. I am absolutely outraged, or whatever I wrote, on their public Twitter thing. Boom, straight away you get a reply. Yes, it worked. We're so sorry, Mr. Green, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I end up having like a private DM message with whoever is on the end of their Twitter feed. Um, we'll send an engineer out tomorrow. So I'm like, okay, so I calm down. Engineer comes out. He goes, oh, yeah, you've got a leak. He turned up when he said he would turn up. That was all good. Um, oh, you've got a leak. So I fixed that. He's like, you've also got a gas leak. I was like, what? <laughs> Couldn't smell it. Um, um, but apparently my boiler was leaking gas. So he fixed that, and I'm like, this is brilliant. This is lunchtime Tuesday. I'm thinking, this is, this is, I've nailed this. This is brilliant. Steps outside to do his final check on my flu. And this is where it went bad. My flu apparently was not sufficient. Now, I don't know if you know what that means, but that basically means you might die, according to the British gas engineer. <laughs> um, five years, six years, we've had it like that, and we've not died yet, funnily enough. Um, so he says, I'm going to have to cap off your boiler. You can't use it. I'm like, come on, mate. I was like, this is outrageous. He's like, I'm going to have to cap it off. You, you, you could die. Somebody could die because fumes might blow back into your house. I'm like, yeah, but they don't. <laughs> you know, like common sense. Come on, mate. Like, all right, it might need to be tweaked or fixed, but do you have to? So he capped it off. Couldn't get an engineer to come out. Anyway, fast forward a week. Um, my mate Nathan Carr, who's uh, Kingdom Heating. I phoned up Nathan, by the way. First, first thing I did was phone up Nathan on the Sunday. Nathan's wife had just had a baby by a cesarean C-section. He was on paternity leave. He, I was like, mate, you're not coming out to help me. Don't worry about it. So anyway, we made do. We waited for Nathan to come and fix it. And, uh, and I've got hot water. Yay! Because Nathan Carr saved us. Before that, Friday night, before the Sunday morning, Lindsay's hoovering upstairs. And um, she goes, oh, no, you know, like the classic, I've hoovered up something. Anyway, she's always hoovering up something. This is on YouTube, so hopefully she won't see it. She hoovers up all kinds of different stuff. I've had to unblock the hoover a couple of times. She's tried, makes it worse. I then come in and save the day. So anyway, she hoovered up a sock on my side of the bedroom. So now it's my fault. If you hadn't put left out that sock on your side of the bedroom, I was like... I don't think I did, but anyway, um, all right, you know, so, then, so there I am, and it's proper stuck, because she's had a go at trying to get it out, it's proper stuck, and so I get, um, I've got a few tools that kind of like, you know, can shove down drains and unblock stuff, so I'm like, ramming this thing down, that's not working, I've got another one, I'm ramming that down, and I'm like, proper ramming it down, Lindsay's mum and brother had arrived, because they were staying the weekend, so they're there, they're watching me outside the back door, ramming stuff in whilst talking, how's your week been, yeah, great, I've been Hoover, and I'm getting more and more mad with this Hoover, <coughs> I don't really have an anger problem until these moments come, and then I'm like, maybe I should... Anyway, um, so I'm like ramming stuff down. I've got a skewer, and I'm bending up, trying to hook out this sock, because I can kind of see it using my torch, but it is stuck, proper stuck. So I'm then like... So then I got something that was a bit harder, and I'm like hammering it into the thing, and then I feel it pop, it gives. I'm like, oh, yes, I've done it. So now I'm enthusiastically ramming this down, trying to, yeah, I can get the sock going back down the other way where it's thinner, uh, no, not thinner, more open, less thin. I can get it in, only to realize Lindsay's like, Ed, I don't think you've got it. I think you've broken the hoover even worse. And as she looks at me, the whole arm of the hoover, you know, that, that springy coily bit, is just completely unraveled, and it's now just a gaping hole in the hoover arm. And I'm looking at it going, ah, not fixing that. <laughs> so then I went on the line, as you do, the interwebs again. Shark, because it's a shark hoover. Recommend them, they're quite good. Um, on, the, on the thing, oh yeah, I can buy an arm, it's 20 quid, it's not the worst thing in the world. So I'll do the order thing, confirm, yeah, do the next bit, confirm, yeah, great. Anyway, Friday comes around, Lindsay's like, hey, where's that hoover arm? You're supposed to have bought it. I was like, oh yeah, well, it should be coming. Check my emails. Can't find an email from them. Do you know what? I didn't click the last confirm, confirm, confirm. How many times do you have to confirm this thing? So eventually I did it, and it came the next day. I've been waiting a week for this Hoover thing, and it's my fault that, again, that didn't come. By the way, the sock was Lindsay's. Just want to put that out there. It wasn't one of mine. It was Lindsay's sock. So this is all going on. On the Thursday, I step out of the house, take the kids to school in the morning. I've got a flat tyre. It's so annoying, isn't it? So I'm like, you know you go over to a flat tyre, don't you, and just give it a kick. Yep, that's flat. <laughs> 
I've got a pump. I pumped it up. It held air. Got to school and back. By like four o'clock, it was completely flat again. That's not the end of the. It's not the worst thing in the world. But it was just annoying. You know, like these things in life happen, don't they? I don't know if it's just like always comes in threes. It's like just just stuff goes on in life, and I was just getting more and more mad about the whole situation. And you're like. I mean, it is like first world problems not having hot water. Like, I've got running water. Like, you know, we've got friends who live up and down the street. And so I'm sending kids around to Adam and Joe's. I'm like messaging Adam. Can Ethan come and have a shower? Can and, uh, Sam and Phil up the other end of the road? Can, like, Lindsay's like, I'm going to Phil and, and Sam's house to have a shower. And, and so we were looked after. And, and we've got some beautiful friends. And we were fine. We were boiling water for washing up. It's not the end of the world. But these things start piling up on you. And you just start kind of, I don't know if you do this. This might just be a me thing, but I don't think it is. You just start wallowing in some kind of self pity at the frustrations of life you're like come on god i'm doing all this stuff i've got these things going on great stuff's happening and yet all of this and you're just like oh and it's frustrating and it's infuriating and i know you can put that into the big perspectives of life and you realize that actually your problems aren't that big but then i find this moment in amongst it all i often go into my front room and these problems are minor, I know. We've had some more serious things happen within our own church family in the last couple of weeks. But when you're in it and you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by it, I then, I, when it's my front room and I picked up my guitar and I strummed a chord and I didn't have any music to play, I just sometimes would just pick it up without any getting my iPad out, any music or any song in mind. I just start to strum and I just start to sing and I just start to pour out my heart to God. In that moment, something shifts. There's a perspective shift. Andy talked about it this morning when he came up. The stuff that's going on, actually, when we lift up our eyes to God, something changes in us. There is power in worship. That song we sung about, behold, like behold him. And we start to sing holy, holy, holy. Like this God who, who we serve, who we follow, who we worship is holy and worthy to be praised. He is the one who sits on the throne, the everlasting God, the one who breathes out stars, who knows them by name, the mighty one. This God, as you start to worship, something happens. Something shifts, something changes. And then as you let that kind of worship turn to like prayers of praise, thank you, God, you start to realize that actually, all right, a hoover, a boiler and a flat tire, they are really frustrating things. The water was by far the worst. Everyone was having cold showers. Caleb came down. Actually, this is a good thing about the cold shower thing. Caleb came down one morning and goes, I am ready for the day. I'm going to do my homework. I'm going to do the washing up. I am ready for the day. He's 15. He never does that. <laughs> it was amazing. It lasted one day. Anyway, um, but in these moments of stuff that crowds in on our lives, actually building that place where you can get together with God just to worship him, to be with him, shifts everything. It changes who you are. It changes what's going on because you suddenly realize there is a God who is in control. There is a God who loves you. He's full of mercy and grace and kindness. And he is worthy to be praised. So how do I go deeper in worship? One of the things you've got to do is just to do it. Worship him. Like, if you want to get better at worship, if you want to get better, that's not the right word. If you want to go deeper in the worship of God, worship him worship him worship him on your own worship him with small groups worship him in the larger group like this worship him and i don't just mean sing songs that's not what i mean it's more far deeper and th than that but singing songs is great and i love it because i'm a musician i'm a worship leader i love it it's one of my go-to's but there's loads of different ways in which you can worship god so i want to encourage you to experiment experiment with different ways of worshiping god whether that's putting on a YouTube song that's from the latest worship band, whether that's sitting in silence with your hands open saying, come Holy Spirit, whether that's going for a walk and marveling at the wonders of creation, um, whether that's reading your Bible, whatever it might be, that's kind of personal stuff, getting together with other people and doing those same things, but with others is great. There's loads of different ways that you can worship. I always say this, there's no rules when it comes to worshiping God other than make sure you're worshiping God. That's like the rule. Worship him. There's no rules of how you do it. If you're an artist, paint pictures. If you're a dancer, dance it out. If you're a poet, write poems. If you just love writing words, it doesn't have to necessarily be a poet. Whatever it is, I don't know. 
do whatever you love doing. If it's sport, play sport. Like we were talking the other day, me and Lindsay. Like what would it look like if just at the back of church there was a couple of lads just kicking a ball during worship, like keepy uppies? I was like, I don't know, something. I was like, well, it could get dangerous. <laughs> oh, there's a ball. <laughs> Someone just got hit in the head. Never mind. Um, I don't know what it looks like, but but certainly on a on a football pitch, like worship God through your football or rugby. Oh gosh, rugby. That's disappointing. Cricket's even worse at the moment. South Africa are loving it, aren't you? Congratulations, South Africa, on the Rugby World Cup and beating England in the cricket. That was depressing. Um, anyway, moving on, <laughs> before I become embroiled in misery again. Um, I just hope United beat City today, then I'll be all right. Moving on. Right. Uh, whatever it is, sport, you worship God. However God made you, use it as an expression of your worship to God. That is worship. Um, personal stuff, do it. I just want to encourage you to do it. When you get to that place of being in the presence of God, it's, it's just life transforming. But I also want to talk to us about how we do that corporately. So we do a lot. We've done a lot over the years. And you've probably heard sermons where people have encouraged you to get in the quiet place in your prayer closet or whatever words you want to use. That stuff is valuable. You should definitely do it. But I want to also talk to us corporately. How do we do this corporately? And a couple of reasons of why we should do it as well. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible encourages corporate worship, funnily enough. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25, uh, the writer encourages the believers to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So the Bible encourages us to get together because it encourages each other. It helps to build us up, as the Corinthians passage said earlier. Um, in that first bit that I wrote, read out, it says, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. The church is us. It's not bricks and mortar. It's us. We get together to be built up, to be encouraged by the getting together of one another, to hear the word preached, but to sing songs, to pray for one another, to celebrate com communion. When we do these things together, you can do all of that on your own. You can have communion on your own. But when you do it together, there is something powerful about when the people of God get together because it encourages each other to keep going in our faith. If you've got a problem, you can bring it and get prayed for. All these kind of things that go on when we get together to worship. Secondly, we can wor worshiping together, coming together brings a unity. Corporate worship allows us as believers to come together in unity to strengthen our faith and to also celebrate that sense of community and belonging together. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. Another reason, praising and exalting God. You can do that on your own, but when you do it with other people, it's great, isn't it? Like when we're all singing Behold Him, that song earlier, and we're all singing Set a Fire and, and um, whatever the, what was the last bit we sang? What were we singing? It was great. I loved it. There was a moment there, I was just loving it. Um, Psalm 95 verse 1 and 2, it says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Do you notice this isn't the same, make a beautiful noise? You don't have to sound good when you're doing this worship stuff. Just make it joyful. Just It doesn't always have to be like, happy upbeat songs either just as make a joyful noise so if your noise is coming out and you don't think it sounds beautiful as long as it's joyful that's all that matters sometimes my noise is not beautiful i'm going to tell you that um uh, make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation let us come into his presence with thanksgiving let us make joyful noise to him with songs of praise another reason why it's really important to do this is that actually we learn so much together and we get taught so much together when we gather through the preaching of the word but also through the songs that we sing. As a worship team, we talk about this quite a lot. That actually, we are teaching you theology when we sing songs. So the lyrics in the songs, you're often going to remember a lyric in a song or a particular song more than you're going to remember what I said. So think like a year's time. You might not even remember that I preached about this, but you remember the lyrics to Behold Him or whatever song it might have been. So we're actually teaching each other, but also there is the teaching of the word as well. You, we get to learn stuff together corporately and to be in that same place where we're being challenged and moved forward and encouraged to keep pressing on and going further with our faith, with our mission, whatever it might be. Colossians 3 verse 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So there it says about teaching. 
but it also says about the singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that actually the word of Christ dwells in us through the singing of songs. So it's important when we do it together, all these things are happening. When we were worshiping this morning, I felt like God dropped something into me, which was a little bit different from what I planned. Some of this I've already shared, I have planned. But the other thing about when we get together, it's about being in the presence of the living God. And that is significant, and that is life-changing. You might not always feel it when you, sang, when you sing a song on a Sunday morning. You might not have felt anything this morning. Some of us might have really felt like the Holy Spirit's here, the presence of God is here, and we're full on in. For others of us, we might have been like, oh, I just don't want to be here this morning. It's not about feeling it. We're often led by our feelings, and that's not always a bad thing. But actually believing it is really powerful. If we come together believing that we are meeting together in the presence of God, irrespective of how we feel, there is power in that. And there's been times where I've turned up to church on a Sunday morning where I've not wanted to be here. And sometimes I've been stood up there singing and leading the worship. I've been like tired or, you know, stuff's going on, hoovers, broken boilers, whatever it might be. Uh, a death in the family, whatever it might be. We get up there and we sing and we declare some stuff and all of a sudden something shifts in our perspective. Um. So as I was preparing for this, I, as I was preparing, as I was in worship, sorry, this morning, um, I was reminded of uh, a couple of things that happen in the Old Testament when it comes to the presence of God. So in one, cha- in one, one chapter, Samuel, in one, I didn't get much sleep last night. I don't know what happened. I just didn't sleep very well. That extra hour just hasn't benefited me at all. Um, I'm a bit annoyed about it. Where's my water gone here? Uh, in one Samuel, uh, verse uh, chapter 6 and 7. The Ark of the Lord, <coughs> it got robbed by the Philistines before this. <coughs> um, those pesky Philistines. They robbed the Ark of the Lord and um, it was carnage for them. The Ark of the Lord messed them up proper. They had boils and rats and uh, statues of their gods were falling over and all kinds of stuff. So they freak out and they think, right, we need to send the Ark back to God. Now the Ark of the Covenant, whenever you read about the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament... It is the presence of God on earth. It is God. <laughs> I would say God in a box, but you know, you get the idea. Um, it's a very special box. Uh, but it's the presence of God on earth. And there's, there's ways of handling that. And the Israelites, they took the ark into battle thinking it would be like their silver bullet or golden box um, that would win them the victory. And it didn't because God's like, this is not how you do it. The Philistines nicked it. They had a whole load of trouble. They sent it back. 1 Samuel 6 and verse 7 is the story of the ark coming back. And when the ark comes back, the people, it, the, the, they send it back on a cart, the Philistines, and the ark ends up in a field. And the people see it, and straight away they, they sacrifice all their cows. They use the, the wood from the cart to build a fire and sacrifice all their cows in the field because they're like, whoa, the ark's back! And um, so they just start worshipping God and sacrificing. And then Samuel um, gathers the people together, and they all turn back towards the Lord, it says. They all turn towards the Lord and they worship him. In the worshipping of God, the Philistine army decided that's the moment they're going to attack. <laughs> For whatever reason, they decide to attack. But God sorts it out. God saves the, the, the people of God and, uh, and he sorts out the Philistine army. And then he fast forward. So then by that point, sorry. There's a whole load of stuff that goes on, and the ark ends up in a particular house for like 20 years. And then um, you fast forward into 2 Samuel. David uh, gets this word from God through Nathan the prophet. And Nathan hears from God, and God's like, you guys are living in a really nice house, and I'm in just this like tin shack out in the sticks. Can you, can you sort that out, please? So David goes about bringing back the ark, and he goes about it in the wrong way. Um, they stick it on a cart, which you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to carry it properly. Uh, the, the, the ox stumbles or chips or hits a stone or something like that. And Uziah, I think that's his name, how you pronounce it, stretches out his hand to save the ark. He's got good intentions, but he's doing it the wrong way. And, and he dies. It's a crazy story. Um, and people are always like, that's a bit mean, isn't it? Well, the whole thing was wrong. They were just going about it in the wrong way. So they park the ark in a house. And the house is the house of a guy called Obed-Edom. Now, I love Obed-Edom. He's, there's not really much about him in the, in the Old Testament except for this. So Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, I think it is. 
My Bible's turned over a few pages to chapter 12, which is not where it is. It's not helpful, Bible. Where are we? Oh, yeah, here we go. So the Ark, uh, yeah. So the Ark of the Covenant is in Obed-Edom's house. And it says that the Lord blessed everything in Obed-Edom's house. He blessed everything. Because the Ark of the the Covenant was there. The presence of God was there. And then, anyway, David seeks God and goes about bringing the Ark back the right way. He also hears how blessed Obed-Edom is. And he's like, I think we need a bit of that blessing. Uh, Let's bring it back proper. So then... David brings back the ark into Jerusalem and you can read about it. It's a long story and they take like a few steps and they do a whole load of sacrifices. Then they take a few more steps to do a whole load more sacrifices. Must have taken blinking ages. Um, But they bring it back. And then what you read in Chronicles is that everywhere you read about the temple after this, Obed-Edom's name is listed in amongst all the names of the people. And he seems to be doing every job on offer in the temple worship. I don't know whether it's like serving the tea and coffee or cleaning the floors or being an instrument, uh, being an instrument, being a musician, playing, playing an instrument. Obed-Edom's name's in there. He's doing everything. And it, and it kind of asks the question, well, why? Because he loves being in the presence of God. He has seen God do amazing stuff in his life and he just wants to be around God. Now, what's amazing for us is that we don't have to go to the temple to be in the presence of God. God's presence is everywhere. Um, but he also says, when two or three gather, there am I. So there's an importance about gathering. It's really important to gather. But you can also be with God wherever you want to go. Like you see Jesus all the time takes himself off away from the disciples to go up a mountain, to go up a hill, to pray on his own with God. So we need to do both. All of it is really important, whether it's on our own, in smaller groups, in larger groups. It's really important. There's something about the presence of God that shifts Obed-Edom and makes him just want to move wherever God is. I'll go wherever you are. And I'm realizing the time, so I'm just going to wrap this up. And as I was preparing for all of this this morning, I really felt like I had a a word from God for us as a church and also for you as Hope Community Church as well. I think this is for us together in this journey of who we are as followers of Jesus, Hall Baptist Church, Hope Community Church, and Overflow Church as well, that God wants to do in our gatherings of worship. When we gather to worship, how do we go deeper? Well, we go deeper by each of us spending that time with God when we're on our own in smaller groups so that when we come together, like in the Corinthians passage at the beginning, we come together prepared to worship God together. That's what Corinthians is talking about. It's talking about order and it's talking about structure and stuff. Um, but it's about being prepared. When we show, so we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn. There's a preparation in that. That would be a lot of hymns if we all had one, by the way. Um, a word of instruction, a revelation. It's not saying you literally have to have a hymn. You, everybody has to have a word of instruction. Everyone has to have a revelation. It's saying that there might be some of you that have a hymn or a revelation or a word of instruction that you can encourage each other with. Um, that's what it's saying. It's saying come prepared as the community, as the, as the family of God. When you get together, come ready to offer something in your worship to God. So actually, how do we go deeper? We go deeper by doing the personal stuff, by doing small group stuff. So that when we come together in a bigger group, in the larger group, there's this sense of anticipation and expectation that God is already doing stuff. And this is an overflow of that into this space. And um, so in my preparation, in my praying and stuff, I've been re- I read Haggai a few weeks ago, and God has just kept speaking to me from Haggai, and I love it. Haggai chapter 1. And um, I started reading it because every time I went into the office, Ollie said, oh, I've just been on a Zoom call where we've been talking about Haggai. Where is Ollie? Is he here somewhere? Oh, he's over there. Um, because they were doing like 19 weeks on a study of Haggai with your work, weren't you, or something? I think it was. Was it your devotions, your team devotions? So every time. So anyway, I sat down at my desk of, uh, like a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to read Haggai because Ollie keeps talking about it. Not that he was saying much about it. He was just like, oh, it's been another Zoom call with another Bible study on Haggai. Um, so I read it. And it's only short. I'd encourage you to read it. It's, it's, a, it's a short book. And Haggai, um, he gets a word from the Lord. And his word from the Lord, and this is at a time, by the way, when they're rebuilding Jerusalem. They're reestablishing themselves as the people of God. And and Haggai gets this word about building the the temple. And then Haggai says um, to the guys that are basically leading the charge on building the temple, the Lord, uh, I'll just read it. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you. That's it. 
<laughs> must have taken him a long time to get that download from God. Um, I am with you. So God says that to, to the people. And then, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. And they came to begin work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day in the sixth month. One of the big themes of the whole of the Old Testament is that God is establishing correct worship. That is a massive theme. In fact, it's probably the biggest theme throughout the whole of the Old Testament. That and then followed up with look after orphans and widows. Both things are really important. Justice for the poor, but also establishing correct worship, doing it in the right way. Worshipping God, giving him the honour and the, the worth that he is due. So as I read this, and I'm thinking about this morning, I'm thinking about how do we go deeper together as a church family in our worship of God? I think there's something in that prayer of like, God, stir up our hearts for you. So that when we come together, we are just overflowing with worship for you. That we'd allow ourselves as a church to discover more of what it means to have our hearts stirred up by the Lord. To you to pray that simple prayer of, Lord, stir my heart for you. And um, when it says about building the house, obviously they're building, physically they're building bricks and mortar. But we're talking like in a spiritual sense of building this house of worship. This house of worship being HBC, being Hope Community Church, being Overflow Church. That Actually, if we allow ourselves to have our hearts stirred for worship of God, I believe like we'll see just great stuff happen in our worship. We will discover more of who God is together. We would have those deeper, that deep revelation of him, that we would have the prophecy bursting out. We would have, which we already have all of this stuff, but we just go after more. I don't know about you, but that set a fire down in my soul, God. I want more of you. I want more and more and more of God. That actually together as a church congregation, we can go deeper with God together in our worship. If we allow that prayer of God to stir our hearts for worship. Does that sound good? Good. Because that's what I feel like God has said to me, to us, that he wants to stir up our hearts, which is why we're doing this whole series, Behold. Because we want to press into understanding, to learning more of what it means to be worshippers of God. But let that prayer be our prayer of, Lord, stir up our hearts and to know that God is with us. Whatever we're going through, hoovers, boilers and flat tyres, or crazier stuff than that's going on in our families, the difficult stuff that we deal with, health issues, problems at work, finances, loved ones passing away, members of our church suffering. In amongst that, our prayer would be, God, stir up our hearts. And we hear his voice whisper back to us, I am with you. I am with you. Worship team, do you want to come up? Can we stand? <clears throat> we thank you, Lord Jesus. You are here with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That you are here in this place. Would you stir up our hearts as we worship you? Just encourage you, just put your hands out in front of you just to posture yourself, just to ready to receive from God. To pray that prayer, God, stir my heart. Stir my heart for you. And to hear his voice, I am with you. I'm with you, HBC. I'm with you, Hope Community Church. I'm with you.